This presentation was developed for the Control and Sensing Systems Unit of the Combined Electronics Framework at Bournemouth University. It's the second in a sequence of short videos to support the unit studies in robotics. This two-part clip gives a non-rigorous thumbnail sketch of how the Kalman filter works. Subsequent videos will fill in some of the detail omitted in this overview. To start with, let's recap the idea of our internal models of system behaviour. When following the path of a plane in a cloudy sky, you mainly rely on direct sight observation of its progress. However, if you lose sight of it when it flies into a cloud, you can use what you know about the flight path direction and speed before it flew in to predict its path through the cloud. You will use your own internalized model of the plane motion to predict where it is over the few seconds it's obscured. We do this trajectory modeling trick all the time. For example, when crossing the road, you'll predict the paths of oncoming vehicles to see if they may intersect with your path and pose a threat. We have inside our heads pretty efficient models of how familiar objects like cars and aircraft in our environment behave, even when our observations of them are a bit dodgy. These models are dynamic. They represent moving things and changing situations. Essentially, the Kalman filter combines a model of the dynamic motion of the object involved with the noisy observations of its progress to get a best guess of where it is. To see how such models can be matched with observations, let's first look at a simple type of experiment where we know we should get a nice linear response. Imagine setting up a model car moving at a constant speed along a track against the scale so it can read off distances as it goes. So we do the experiment and then record our results, which when entered on the graph might look something like the one shown on the slide. Now because of experimental errors in timing and reading the scale, the results will be noisy and don't immediately fit onto our expected straight line. The simplest approach here is to line up a ruler by eye to get the best fit we can to the data points and then to draw the line. To do this more accurately, however, we need a way to assess how well the line fits the data. We want our line to minimize the errors between the noisy observations and the straight line model estimates, the pointy hat values. These errors can be positive or negative, so it's convenient to square them to get rid of the negative signs so that then we can simply add them up to get a number r representing the total error of how good the fit is. The line which fits the data points best will have the smallest error number. And a computer package such as MATLAB can be used to find this best fit line. This is the optimum least squares error solution. Now this is fine if we know the result should be a straight line. But an airplane, say, may not be moving in a straight line. We could fit more complex functions if we knew the best one to imitate the behavior we're observing. On this slide, we have four data points marked in red. Perhaps these data points were obtained from an altitude reading of an aircraft, say. Now, if you think the aircraft is flying at a constant height, then our best guess to that height is the average of our four readings, the blue line at around 1.6 kilometers, say, with the model x pointy hat is 1.6. This gives an error number or residual of r equals 4.06, a big number, because the blue line estimate is not that close to the data points. On the other hand, if we think the aircraft is climbing at a steady rate, then our best guess is to fit a straight line through the data points, just as in the last slide. This gives the green line showing how the aircraft climbs from around 800 meters to 2.4 kilometers or so within our measurement time frame, with the model x pointy hat is 0.79 plus 0.54 t and an improved residual of r equals 2.61, signifying a better fit. Now we're on a model hunt. We've so far tried two models for the plane motion, a constant and a straight line. Mathematically, these are the first two of a series of possible models, polynomials, which increase in complexity to represent more complicated motions. Now if we suspect the plane isn't climbing at a constant rate, we could try to fit a quadratic equation to our data. The result of this is shown in the violet curve. In fact, the extra quadratic term here hasn't improved things very much, as shown by the residual only reducing to a value of 2.6. What about one step further? Well, a constant can fit through one data point. A straight line can go through any two data points. 
A quadratic can curve around three data points, and a cubic curve can be made to pass through any four given data points. So we see the black dash dot cubic curve passing through all of our data points with a residual of r equals zero, a perfect fit. Unfortunately, that's not what we want. Because we know the data points have errors, and we don't necessarily need to intersect them all exactly. What we need to do is to fit the most probable motion of the plane. And passengers certainly wouldn't like the cubic ride. So the crucial point is to try and first determine the model or equation that the actual vehicle will behave with. The better our model, the more we know about the aircraft behaviour, the more realistic will be our fit to the data. The Kalman filter works in real time on a stream of input observation data to give the optimal least squares fit of the model which describes the dynamic motion of the car or airplane we're watching to this noisy observation data. And it's implemented as an algorithm running on an embedded computer or processor. Let's look at these points in turn. We must first rearrange our best fit approach to work in real time. Digital computers crunch numbers. To process data with a computer, we need to sample the signals from our sensors using converters, which produce a sequence of binary number values at discrete time steps. The output is also a sequence of numbers which are passed through a D to A converter to produce the output signal. Our computer-based models must therefore operate with sampled inputs at discrete time steps, counting from zero, and where k is the current time step. This slide shows how we might fit the straight line model to our data on a real-time basis. Starting with the one data value at k equals zero, at k equals one, we get another value and we can fit a straight line between the two. At k equals two, we now have three points and need to do a best fit estimate. As sample values continue to come in, the best fit line will then move to accommodate all of the available information. That, however, was a simple line fit. Now we can go on to look at a model of how dynamic systems like cars and aircraft actually move. And this model usually takes the form of difference equations, a sampled form of differential equations. A common property of many dynamic systems is that the rate at which things change depends in some way on how big they are. For example, the faster a vehicle moves, the more frictional and air resistance forces it has to overcome. If the engine stops, then the initial loss of speed will be high. But as the vehicle slows down, the losses become less, and the slower will be its loss of speed. In other words, the deceleration, or rate of change of speed, depends upon the speed. In these results, for example, the deceleration at 60 miles per hour is around 30 miles per hour every second. Well, at 30 miles per hour, the car might only lose around 15 miles per hour of speed every second. Our computer model must predict the state of our system, which we will call x, starting from some known or assumed initial value x0 at time 0, and progressing step by step to the current time step k. Many systems will also have a drive input, u, but in our case we'll assume that the car engine switched off so that u equals 0. We'll also, for convenience, assume a time interval of one second between our sample values. The model here for the decelerating car is that x k plus 1, at the next time step, is equal to half of x k, with no contribution from the drive input. So starting with the initial speed of x naught is 60 miles per hour, the predicted next value becomes 0.5 of 60, or 30 miles per hour. After one second delay, we move on to the next time step, x 1 is 30, and the prediction becomes 0.5 of 30, or 15 miles per hour. And so we continue, step by step, to map out the model behavior, at any given time k, the model will predict the system state x at the next time step k plus 1. It's a bit lumpy here because we've chosen a large time interval, and we could improve things by taking finer steps, but it does show the general behavior of the actual vehicle. For more complex systems, we'll have lots of equations like that in the previous slide. The state space form is a matrix representation which groups these equations together. Here, the x term now represents a vector or listing of all the important variables in the system in question, whether they are speeds, temperatures, voltages, pressures, or whatever. Now we have a model of our system dynamics, we can pick things up in part two with a look at the model of the observation data.